everyone. Um, I looked at the name list and I thought there were quite a few names I didn't know, but I know most faces I've come across still around the place. Um, I'm a neuropsychologist. I work at Outpatient Rehab, which is the main reason for not probably coming across a lot of you. Um, today, I want to talk about a couple of things, if I get a chance to get onto the second topic. Um, I've titled the talk for today, Control Over Cognition, and that's because uh, the aspect of neuropsychological functioning that I want to draw your attention to is, uh, of, <laughs> of cognition, is uh, executive functioning. Um, so I want to give you a bit of a primer on executive function and dysfunction, as well as, if I get a chance to get onto it, uh, when people are wanting to seek control over their cognitive decline or, or improve their cognition, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a, a rundown on the current industry opinion um, on brain training. Um, so I've created a very, very simple conceptualization. Why did you create it? I've put up a very good, um, simple conceptualization to orient you in very broad terms to uh, the way we can, we all the uh, aspects of neuropsychological function that we assess. Uh, the OTs amongst us and probably a lot of other speeches will probably be aware of these and quite familiar from, with them from screening assessments. Uh, the basis of this model is that we, we require arousal and alertness for other cognitive functions to occur. So your ability to attend is going to be quite poor if you're um, in a semi-conscious state or in a delirium. Uh, and the most common thing I think I end up educating clients about is the interaction between these these levels. So most commonly people will come in talking about problems with forgetting and memory, but often when you do testing, it's, it, it's the impact of attention uh, and actually getting information in that, that affects their, their memory. So we could talk about that for a while, but I want to talk about the little one that sits on the top. Uh, up there, like the icing on the cake, executive function. Um, I'm not quite happy with it being so small at the top there because I think it exerts so much control uh, over the rest of the, the functions there. So turn it on its head and I want today to think about executive functioning um, as that stabiliser up the top. So you can have other cognitive functions that are functioning at, uh, at a level that, that you would expect for that person, but if their executive function is disrupted, then the rest of them, the ability to put them into practice, the, these other things, things such as memory and attention, might be disturbed. I'm just say why I that from home. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so I want to have a think first up. Uh, I want to talk really quite clinically today and in broad terms. Um, I'm not going to talk about how we assess cognitive uh, executive function. Uh, I just want to bring up a few examples to bring it to the, the forefront of your mind. Um, so a person who is able to remember things um, will be able to take in the information that a doctor gives them about the medications they require, what doses they require, and when they can take it, and they might be able to tell anyone who asks them quite clearly what that is. Uh, and another person with good cognitive functioning otherwise might know what household chores they need to undertake to maintain a hygienic and clean house. And they are possibly quite able to both mentally and physically carry out those tasks. Uh, and another person might know the health risks of an unhealthy diet and be able to talk those through, say, with their dietitian or any of their other clinicians. But often people, when executive functioning comes into the picture, might not be able to adhere to a routine. They might have difficulty remembering to remember. So without a prompt that, that um, helps them to remember when to take the medication, they might get to the end of the day and they haven't taken the medication. And I just want to bring to your attention some language that can often be used uh, around that, that may have a cognitive basis or an executive functioning basis. So we hear non-compliant use quite often within um, the, the health field. 
Another way that this could apply more to allied health is prescribed physio exercises or even prescribed speech recommendations. I had a client uh, recently who could tell me most of his speech strategies that were written out in his file. Um, and he even stated, Don't those chin tucks are really good when I use them. And I said, okay, so do you use them regularly? And he said, no. And it turned out that the only thing that would really, really prompt him to use them would be if he choked. Mm -hmm. um, so then he'd have that, that real prompt that that's what he needed to do and he'd probably remember to do it maybe for the next few times. And that strategy is only good if the first choke's a very <laughs> small <laughs> one. Um, the second one, the person might know what household chores they need to to do, but they're unable to get moving. So these people might find that, actually I'll give you a, I'll give you another example. So these people are often labelled as lazy, and they might label themselves as lazy, um, their, their family members might do this. Just to give you an example of one where motivation wasn't a factor for this man. He, um, while he was in inpatients, had written a list of things he wanted to do, tinkering in his shed when he got home. It's a, it's a love of his. He, um, so he was definitely motivated, but he stated that he just found it hard to get started. So this man who otherwise can do, he might have been somewhat effective in what he could do um, once he got to the shed, but he was generally capable of doing the task. He then um, found that sometimes he'd just sit down all day and once, once he got started, he found, sometimes found it hard to stop and we can talk about that a little bit later as well. But uh, there's an example of someone who who just isn't able to initiate the behaviour. And the last one, I actually run the risk of implicating myself and probably <laughs> a few of us here as having executive functioning deficits. But um, I guess what to think about here is that if a person um, is making or unable to control their urges at a level that is different to what they've always, to how they've always been, or if it's causing them real issues, we might want to think about what might be behind that. Um, this can work the other way as well. The very recently, Ron and I saw someone who uh, has a had a, a stroke in the very medial part of their brain, so it's affected their memory structures. This person is returning to work. Slowly, um, and there are issues, but they're, they're really open to strategies, seem to be implementing them really well, have talked to people and been able to set up communication and seek help when they need it. So, um, memory problems and attention problems can be really disastrous as well for a person's functioning, but sometimes executive functioning can, can help in that way. Um, so, executive functioning includes a range of different abilities. Uh, generally, a lot of them are aimed at goal-directed behaviour, um, having the will, being able to plan and organise, initiate the task, sequence the sub-components of the task. Um, a person will need to be flexible in their approach. If something changes, they need to be able to um, keep in mind what they were doing and, and adjust their approach accordingly. Uh, we also talked about inhibiting impulses and undesirable behaviours. So if we think about behaviour, I won't read through all of this, but if you think about the process of behaviour uh, and you have a look at all those words that I've highlighted there, you can see that there really are a lot of ways that an exec even one executive functioning could be problematic and the whole thing could derail uh, such that maybe if it's earlier on the behaviour wouldn't happen at all. If it's in the middle, perhaps it might be um, unmeaningful and if it's towards the end there with some of those you might find that it's actually really unhelpful for the person such as the, the video that we saw before. So I just want to bring your your attention more to the anatomy below this uh, these executive functions and I think I'm guilty of this as well um, executive functioning being uh, classified really as frontal lobe functioning. We often refer to frontal presentations and everything like that. Um, this is more a matter of clarification just so you're aware that executive dysfunction can occur if we don't have a discrete uh, lesion in the frontal lobes or dysfunction to the frontal lobes. Uh, there are 
it's underpinned as most cognitive functions are by lots of networks throughout the brain, but what they have in common is their connectivity to the frontal lobes, and specifically the prefrontal cortex, so the front of the frontal lobes. Uh, the, so in bringing that home to think, or, or to, to just describe some of the other uh, areas of the brain involved, the basal ganglia have a role to play and they have strong, a lot of circuits that run between the basal ganglia and the prefrontal cortex, and you might see that described as frontostriatal circuitry. Uh, there's parts of the thalamus and the cerebellum, but all parts of the brain have connections with the frontal lobes. The reason I've uh, provided a split of the um, regions of the prefrontal cortex is not because it's really important to know. You often don't know the exact uh, place that a lesion occurs, but it's just so you, you know that executive functions occur in different, uh, or different executive functions are underpinned by different parts of the brain, therefore you can have um, some but not other executive functioning de deficits, which I'm so sure you know, but a, a beneficial way sometimes to split them up is to look at disorders of drive versus disorders of control. Uh, I wanted to just give you a bit of a case study here to describe uh, or illustrate how these can be, uh, these can present, and even within the, the one person. So I'm talking about a man here who had Parkinson's disease. He were, was referred by his physiotherapist because he wasn't implementing strategies in between his uh, sessions. It was leading to some quite significant functional problems and we wanted to rule out whether he was forgetting because that's, that's really what it sort of came across as. Um, his wife was also at, his, at her wits end with his laziness and self-serving and at times risky behaviour. Testing when I saw him demonstrated that <laughs> most of his cognitive functions were pretty good and even on testing I couldn't really elicit too many executive functions that were, were problematic. But what often, often happens with Parkinson's disease is that we see the aspects of a disorder of drive and the attention aspects of the inability to, I guess, flexibly move your attention from one task to another and an inability to initiate. So people will have one of those loops that we talked about seems to be more affected than others and causes the disorder of drive. What was happening was that when this man was medicated, that was pretty good. So in his motor, side of things, his motor loops were pretty good, so he, when he was on dopamine, um, lived over and dopamine and agonists. But then, once, uh, when he was on these, these medications, it was almost overstimulating one of the other circuits or parts of the frontal lobes, which meant that uh, he would go through phases where he was unmedicated and he'd have a bit of a disorder of drive. He was medicated and he'd show disorders of control. So that's when the risky behaviours and things would occur. This man ended up having um, deep brain stimulation, which doesn't necessarily help with the cognitive side of things in terms of the sort of drive. I didn't follow him up, unfortunately, to see, but I know that certainly being able to reduce his medications helped with the, the disorder of control. Um, so given that so many areas of the brain can uh, subserve executive function. I just thought I'd list out a few there. We know about those ones in the middle and we sort of expect and maybe look for it in neurological conditions. It also is underpinning a lot of the a lot of developmental and mental illnesses. But I want to think about or, or bring to your mind as well those ones down the bottom there. Things like uh, cardiovascular disease which can lead to cerebrovascular disease, things like um, heart disease, uh, COPD, and things like diabetes as well. Particularly poorly controlled diabetes can lead to the change to issues with these front frontostriatal or frontal circuits. You've got another five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Uh, so, having said all that, I want to draw us back to a clinical example again, uh, and think, and I guess really just try to think about the language that is used, because you might see these things either said by other other staff, by clients, families, and 
they might be little triggers to have a think about what's going on for the person. So, I recently saw a client who was referred to the neuro rehab clinic for a stroke that impacted his uh, speech and his right-sided motor function. There were many problems with the follow-through of recommendations for this client. Uh, and in fact, he was the one that I described earlier that talked about the chin tucks. The, probably the major thing that was going on for this client was that his partner was becoming extremely frustrated with, with the way he was presenting. She described him as extraordinarily lazy. And she, she, did, she described that this had long been the case. There were certainly pre-morbid personality factors going on here, and none of us really doubted that that was the case. And I'm not trying to say that every time a person's lazy, we need to completely excuse it as, as uh, executive dysfunction. We, but uh, in this case, some of the things that she described were just, they, they did make you think it was probably a cognitive basis, plus he had a stroke. And then as you uh, delve further into his history, uh, it was found that he had had previous strokes and also the recent MRI showed a, an old frontal lobe, right frontal lobe hemorrhage. Now, interestingly, there was no clinical correlation to that, no hospital visit or anything like that. So it is quite possible that this occurred and didn't affect his motor or speech functioning and therefore uh, impacted the way he was living life. He was apparently living in squalor and uh, never did anything to look after himself. And to bring home the point that this client is lazy, the client, the, the, what, the partner was saying that he, even before his stroke, he'd just go and sit in the supermarket. And this was in a couple of years prior. He'd go and sit at the supermarket for so long that the police were called. And he just didn't move on and he had no reason to be doing that. She said, you know, he got a card in the mail. It was just a, um, a bank card, but he, I timed it. He stared at it for nine minutes. Why would he, why would he do this? And by having some, uh, of course, there's often <coughs> changes in dynamic that can occur when you've got an insidious onset of executive functions in the dynamic of a person's relationship but hopefully by being able to provide the wife with some information about potential executive causes will allow her to um, to be open to providing more support to him provide more care or support uh, I think I guess something else to rule out in that kind of situation when you're hearing about that kind of thing is mood related um, uh, causes as well and there certainly didn't appear to be any of those in that case. So another thing that that can often be really frustrating for us and for families is that with executive functions, the fact that a person can say and can remember what's going on doesn't mean that they're going to put it into action. And that's because as we as we uh, know, memory, verbalising, those kind of things while there are frontal, frontal and executive contributions, they're more involved with more posterior or temporal lobe parts of the brain, whereas if the damage is in the frontal lobes, it doesn't mean they're going to put it into practice. We might talk about strategies a bit later on if we get a chance. Um, so I think I've talked about the take-home messages throughout as we've gone, gone through, but it's just the purpose of this talk was to help you to potentially identify executive functioning deficits when you see them and think about other ways that you might be able to address what might be non-compliance or, or, or laziness. Um, do you want me to just talk on this very briefly? Very briefly. Uh, I, ha I have a lot of questions from people asking about whether brain training is beneficial and I thought that you being in the healthcare field might find that you, you feel similar questions. I've put up a summary of the, the consensus article, and I should have referenced it, I'll do it if the notes go around, uh, the reference article by a lot of uh, researchers and clinicians in the field. Basically, the things, brain training exercises uh, that are, have, the, the evidence is showing that they, they do improve your ability on those tasks, but they don't just necessarily generalise to day-to-day -day, uh, day -to -day functioning. The, they don't show that they do harm, but 
if you think that a person's, if you think about the fact that a person might sit in a room on a computer screen when otherwise they could be out exercising or doing something that's socialising, doing something that's really beneficial or a functional task, then then in effect are they doing harm the other way to think about it, whether it's doing harm is if the person can't afford them and they're um, forking out a lot of money in order to do them. And I think there's actually just been a class action um, about the advertising of some of the, one of these programs and the fact basically saying it's preying on the anxieties of, of elderly and, and I think there's a lot around that people could do that don't cost them money. So if they're keen on doing them, take on board those or practice functional tasks. So I think that's where I'll stop and I'm sorry for also going over time. Thank you.